Hello, and welcome to How to Build a High School Esports Program here at Dean HTV. My name is Logan Hermes. I am our Esports Program Solutions Marketing Manager, and I'm here today with the illustrious Christopher Turner and Bubba Gator to talk about the opportunity in high schools uh, that is currently throughout the United States and Canada on starting esports and gaming programs, whether they be clubs, whether they be community initiatives from a parts and rec space, you're looking at a retail space that is also, you know, really focused on capturing uh, youth growth STEM mindset. We're going to cover a lot of topics today, and I'm excited to be here with you all. Uh, stay tuned. Obviously, bring your friends. Uh, we're giving away three hundred dollar DoorDash gift cards uh, to attendees today. It's going to be very exciting. Uh, a quick call out to our featured partners today. We want to call it Intel, uh, Lenovo, Logitech, MSI, AOC Gaming, NVIDIA, and Razer. Uh, partners that you see on the screen throughout today have all previously supported our program, but to those specific ones, we thank you, uh, and I, we appreciate your partnership with DNH. Now, before we begin, before we do anything else, I want to I want to give the floor to two very impressive men in the space. Uh, one you've seen on our broadcast before, maybe at a couple of shows, uh, and the other, which I'll introduce first, is Christopher Turner. Christopher Turner, tell us about yourself. What do you do? Uh, what's your favorite color? Uh, give us the whole thing. Mm. Favorite color is blue. You can't go wrong with buying me anything blue. Uh, but I'm general manager, head esports coach for Southern University Laboratory School, which is a K through 20. I mean, a K through 12 school on Southern University's main campus. I'm also the general manager, head esports coach for the undergraduate at Southern University, and I'm the uh, coordinator for the Mixed Reality Virtual Innovation Gaming Esports Institute at Southern University Law Center. Awesome. That's just an impressive title in and of itself. <laughs> uh, Bubba, what, what's your what's your, what's your your impressive title? Um, well, mine is Googler of words that Logan says. I had to look <laughs> up illustrious earlier and uh, make sure I knew what that was, so thank you. Uh, I'm an esports uh, industry host and consultant, and I also get to be the executive director of the Varsity Esports Foundation, a nonprofit charity supporting students in low income areas and disenfranchised students with STEM education through esports clubs. Awesome. Um, again, thank you for being here. Um, we did have Connor, uh, but he had a personal matter to attend to, and he kind of dipped out, which is perfectly fine. We're going to cover a lot of stuff today. My name is Logan Hermes. I have an interest introduced myself fully um, and I currently still operate as the head of operations for Minnesota Esports Club, uh, a nonprofit in the state of Minnesota, which I am right now uh, and I'm slowly moving. I had to move a bunch of boxes from my background. Uh, so it's really exciting time to be me in the month of June um, where I work with interns. We you know, work in the middle and high school space to make sure that schools that don't have programs or aren't interested in starting, which we'll talk about as a nice little segue you know, those students can still experience a place to play in competition, um, as well as coaching and mentorship. So let's get right down to brass tacks. Uh, my first question is going to be a general, it's gonna be a, it's a, a low ball to both of you. Uh, we'll start with Bubba. What do you mm -hmm. believe is the opportunity? Um, because this is a lot of proposals that, you know, uh, partners that are, are watching are looking at. What is this opportunity for high schools uh, when it comes to esports, how can they leverage it? What is the main pull for them that might want them to, you know, start a program? The high schools, or we're we talking, or in audience to the resellers yeah. today? Okay, yeah. Well, let's talk about GPA. Let's talk about attendance. Let's talk about uh, career and college opportunities. The benefits to high schools, their staff, their administration, uh, the students. Those. All those have high benefits. Um, I can throw out a lot of numbers at you. And all those numbers are that we see with students competing or playing in esport programs at high schools, the high school level, uh, combined with a form of curriculum or an after school program or a competition, any of that really in there. We're seeing students who are attending that program who most likely don't participate in any other extracurricular activities because we actually surveyed that. 82% of those students who participate in those clubs say they've never participated in any other extracurricular activity ever in school. 
And what that does is it brings these kids to school because it's the chocolate on the broccoli. It brings them in. And sometimes it's actually a credit bearing course, as, as, as Chris Turner here will tell you, or it's during the school time uh, at, a, at a certain hour. And the attendance is going up by 10% we see and GPA um, going up 1.7 on average for students. So you get kids involved in things and they're going to find a way to be better at their grades and show up and make sure they're there for their team just like they would for any sport or other activity that they do on campus. Perfect. Uh, you got anything to add to that, Chris? Any uh, specific uh, reasons that you have seen maybe in practice that high schools have been able to grab onto? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's a cultural phenomenon as far as, you know, meeting students where they are. Uh, they gain, that's, that's what they do. Not saying that you don't still have traditional athletes uh, at the school or you don't have subcultures in the school. But I like to tell people all the time, it's the best thing I've saw since food that can bring all walks of people together. Uh, and so when you talk about high school um, campus, you can have quote unquote jocks, quote unquote nerds, introverts, anybody that you can think of coming to one space and actually have something in common, actually talk to each other. You know, you still have that competitive nature but it's a community like no other. So uh, I think when administrators see that, uh, when parents see that, you know, it's a straight buy-in. Okay, how how do we make this uh, this work within within our campus? And not only that, not not from a community basis, but as far as it being a gateway to everything STEM uh, or, or STEAM. So you know, whether you have graphic design at your campus, you know, uh, coding. 3D rendering, whatever it is, it's a gateway to open that conversation to make the kid feel comfortable enough to get into those areas of expertise where, you know, like Bubba said, with college and career pathways, you know, you can go into college or a career and easily make it a decent living. Perfect. Uh, and I think, obviously, those are amazing points. But as we dig a little deeper uh, throughout today, um, I do want to talk about that this is more than just gaming, right? Uh, preconceived notions of, you know, we're, well, we'll build a, a gaming lab, you know, or, or we'll build an esports, uh, but how are, you know, we going to implement other parts of the scholastic experience into this, right? And Chris Turner, you brought up a great point, right? There is STEM initiatives that you can do. There's coding, there's VR, there's, you know, a, a way that you can bring in game design Right, which is highly coveted in this digital age, you know, back into also you're going to have competitions that bring in folks from all walks of life um, from different titles. And I think it's hinging on that point um, as we reach out to schools. Um, I'm going to push our first polling question, wonderful interactive, uh, for, you know, what types of gaming opportunities do you see in your local and state community? My question to you two while I push it out is, are you seeing still today, right? We've been here, we've we've uh, watched the scene grow uh, year by year. Are you seeing individual schools pick it up? Are you seeing it start at a district level? You know, or maybe you're seeing more parks and recs or you're seeing more retail gaming spaces. Um, where are you, where's the pulse when it comes to kind of uh, you? And I'll start again with you, Chris Turner. Um, are kind of, are you seeing it on the individual district or maybe even a statewide level? I would say, you know, all all of the above i'm i'm in louisiana so you know we're we're not in a big quote unquote i guess culturally esports market you know we're, we're heavily involved in sports but i've saw individual schools uh the school that i'm at you know it was an individual decision between uh myself and my director uh herman brister to start a program uh from scratch and then you have the school district i've saw uh local school district East Baton Rouge Parish Schools, uh, they have an initiative. So they actually are doing a esports road show, which is unique. I've never saw a road show before, but they they actually, hey, we're going to be at this school this day, uh, you know, another school this weekend. We're going to do, you know, Rocket League tournament here. And it's, I think that's a great way to, to uh, introduce esports to your whole district before setting, setting in stone and actually starting the program. And then statewide, from a <clears throat> from a college perspective in Louisiana, I've saw a lot of colleges get into the space. 
Um, some have a full program as far as, you know, varsity, um, you know, competition. Uh, they're focusing on curriculum. Um, I've saw actually colleges that just invest in the space and let the community organically build itself. Yeah. Uh, to the to the roadmap. <laughs> but it's but it's great though just to see that type of growth. And I I definitely agree because it hits on all of these points, right? Like it's not just a singular way. And I, I don't want the folks on, on, on this uh that are listening and being like, oh, I have to go after a specific school, right? Um Bubba, I'm gonna make a statement. Uh and as we look at the uh results here, uh when you're looking at you know, spreading out, you know, esports and gaming and, and really trying to teach, you know, uh, how to be good stewards of your time, you know, how to work with uh, these kids to make sure that you're combating maybe negative stereotypes. Uh, are you seeing it uh, throughout, you know, a holistic community when a school brings it on? Or is it kind of maybe small pockets where you're going, oh, there's a school here that has it, maybe a school over here that has it, you know, is the sure. community starting to build? Yeah, definitely, definitely, Logan. I mean, Chris is a good example down in Louisiana of his impact being felt not only nationally, people recognize what Chris is doing <clears throat> in Louisiana and regionally. I mean, I have people, if they call me from Louisiana, I say, have you talked to Chris Turner yet? I mean, if I have people in New York that say, have you talked to Chris Turner yet? So those those kind of things, we see the community growing because we have uh, leaders in the space that are educators that are starting programs and maybe not uh, coaching seven different teams like Chris does uh, from kindergarten through college or pro. And so they're out there. When I look at the numbers, though, we have 35,000 high schools in the United States from public to private to parochial to charter. And right now, over the past eight years, I've seen about 5,000 high schools in the at last eight years start some form of a gaming club or an esports club more more competitive i'd say more of a competitive uh club for esports there's there's been gaming clubs around for some time but the acceptance is there so when i when i look at this two ways when i think about the resellers watching today and there's 50 of you guys out there watching right now and um i think about okay people saying no this will never catch on Two, two ways I can think of this. One, yeah, it has. There's 5,000 schools have accomplished it, and they're doing it. And 100 and, you know, 1,000 of those are doing it really, really well. And then <clears throat> there are then 30,000 schools that need to start or, or could start, and you have the opportunity to bring um, devices and equipment and opportunity to them through esports, through that chocolate on the broccoli, through those opportunities to be able to share with them what gaming and esports could be in their school. Now, kind of to wrap or wrap this up is those common objections you do see, and we spend a lot of time helping um, uh, people find uh, fine tune their answers on people talking about violence and video games and screen time. And if you look at the dnh.com/esports at the bottom, there is a certification there for resellers that I know we're going to talk even more about that uh, we help put together. And there's a whole section in the training for that certification that talks about common objections and belonging as well and inclusion and everything else. So it's being accepted by the community. There's a lot of room opportunity, I should say. And going back to, there's a lot of people who have been doing it. So there's proof to be able to do something out there for the schools in your area. Perfect. And touching on that, because I appreciate the insight that you are bringing to this conversation. Uh, but going back to you, Bubba, because we talked about the certification, who are you going to approach? A lot of these polls, uh, uh, the fir first poll that came through is, you know, we're going after individual schools. We had 58 of 58% of, of our, you know, 50 attendees, right? Uh, like over half say, I want to go to an individual school with this ask. And so, yes, we can see the data slide again. Heck yeah. 58% uh, of those schools. And so the biggest part of that is finding who to approach. So Bubba, when you're approaching an individual school, and, and Chris, feel free to chime in whenever on this, um, mm -hmm. are, who are you going after? Like, who is going to be this champion of the program? Because mm -hmm. obviously some students sure. can't, you know, just say, hey, I want to do this and structure their way through the bureaucracy of it, right? Well, I mean, they can. 
th- th- what we normally actually what we normally see is because <laughs> <laughs> because teachers yeah teachers may live on TikTok uh, because we're millennials and and Gen Xers and we probably spend up till two a.m. finding things on TikTok, but most of the time these kids are learning about the ability to have a gaming club or an esports club from social media or from friends of friends of friends that are sharing something on social media, right? Crowdsourcing it. So the, the students can be champions and it may, the idea may build there and start there, but maybe 10% of the schools I've worked with over the years have just the student leading everything, which is a still a good number. There's a lot of kids leading it. But they've gotten as if if you started a club in high school like I did, uh, we had to get a teacher sponsor, right? Even though the teacher maybe mm-hmm. was in the room for a club, right? Uh, or maybe they were and they're just you know, not playing Fortnite or something, right, Chris, uh, at the school, yeah. and uh, <laughs> or uh, you know on their phone or whatever. But there's an ability for students to start it. But when it really gets going for resellers to to know who they need to talk to, that's what we're really talking about. What we're really talking about is what champions do you find that are adults that will be listened to will be heard and typically it's it person it director who is also the yes and the no man or or woe man no or yes or no because they they typically say yes to yeah we can do this on our computers or no we're never letting you put anything on our computers because the world may end and you can't touch my firewall so there's a there's a there's that with the IT, they have the ultimate yes or no, but they also get told by their administrators, hey, I want this thing that I don't know how it works. Can you put it on our computers? Fine. So you have champions in different ways. It's just kind of how you talk and how you find those champions, whether they be the IT person who knows what they're talking about or the administrator who's passionate about it or the teacher who's passionate about it that then can uh, go and say, hey, I want this done. How do we get it done? What, what do we use? Hey, person that's coming to my school that is trying to sell us equipment, do you have any resources by chance from DNH that you could provide us with that teach us how to start a club? And so, yeah, there are different levels of champions. It's really just figuring out. But getting in the front door is why we created that certification. It's so you could walk in with a badge and say, look, I know what I'm talking about. I, I want to help your school and help your kids. Awesome. All right, Chris Turner, uh, you know, who are you approaching? Who's who's this go to? You know, you've started uh, multiple initiatives, right? And sometimes you've had to be True. that go to person, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what does that feel like? What what resources are you expecting from the school itself? And then, if you're buying equipment or outfitting a lab, you know, what are you expecting from those that are you know here to here to sell you that or bring you that experience? You know. Um... For I think for a lot of people, uh, or a lot of people that are in education, whether it's, you know, you know, I know we're talking high school, but let's just say K through twelve, they love one stop solutions, like they want to feel like, hey, I'm in great hands, we can just plug and play. And I know esports might not be that lane where you can kind of plug and play everything because you have different. You know, specs on different games, you got a different firewall, you got all these things that come up, right? But, you know, being in the hands of somebody like DNH or, you know, going to somebody that's the yes man, like Bubba said, you know, a lot of the times it's IT, but a lot of the times at smaller schools, it's your admin team, it's it's your principal, it's your vice principal. And so before IT can say yes, you have to sell this to a principal. Uh, and you have to sell it to them in a way of, hey, <clears throat> it's not just gaming uh, or her. Uh, hey, these are these are the tracks. These are the educational tracks. These are the college and career pathways. Uh, they are data-driven people. So, you, you know, like Bubba were throwing out numbers earlier, they live with data and real-time data. So that's my that's my expertise not only sell them on the front end as far as culturally what what esports is but on the back end showing them the real true data and and saying hey this is where we're heading this is where we are and hey this is the projector where we're going and a great way you can find some of that data uh is at varsityesportsfoundation.org uh (laughs) why dash school (laughs) dash esports uh, you can find a lot of that on the sense of belonging, how many teams play, obviously uh, more uh, courses that aren't uh, a reseller course that you can introduce to educators. 
as well as, you know, why not make esports productive, the GPAs increases, and then financial assistance. And we'll talk about the financial piece in a second for the individual schools. But for this polling question, uh, by the way, if you haven't noticed, I used to be an esports caster. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little fast. Ask any questions if you want clarification. Uh, because I, I love to used to cast League of Legends and Overwatch. So if you have interest in those games, hit me up. I'll cast your gold level game, I promise you. Um, but the question we have up here is, you know, do you know who to contact? And this goes over the line of thought that we're you know, trying to navigate through is, do you have that point person at, at a district? And for a lot of, for about 66% here, uh, you know, they don't. And, and, and the big part is it could be, right? If you're looking at a higher education solution, it could be the athletic director. Right. The athletic director brings it to the IT. Right. But Chris Turner brought up a great point. You need numbers. Right. You need to know at some level or maybe you're pulling from nationwide numbers and you don't know where to get them. Don't worry. Reach out to our team, esports, our esports team at dnhcom slash esports. Give a free consultation. I will personally sit in a meeting with you and we can try and bang out numbers on a state level. You know, 30 minutes, we can get that done. Right. We want to help build your proposals so that when an athletic director comes back or you know, the CFO of, a, of an institution or a district just goes, I don't see it, right? I don't see why we want to, you know, spend the equipment cost up front. We can then point to, all right, let's build out your proposal the right way, right? And then we're going to rely on you, our, our trusted partners here, to, to finish selling it, right? Um, and if you want to bring our sales specialists on the call, fantastic. Like, we are here to help you, and we're here to find that person for the 66% of you um, that are still looking or like, hey, I have this school or this school district. Um, we're here to help you find that. Um, and so if you're free to schedule that consultation, uh, it'd be incredibly helpful. And I love it. I love starting uh, programs, or at least for the folks on this call, we want to see it more widely accepted. Um, and it has. Don't get me wrong. Esports across the United States and Canada is becoming more accepted day after day, right? So any barriers that you have going, you know, I don't know if I can convince um, this school admin who's been there for 20 years uh, to, to start a gaming initiative, um, maybe rephrase that, right? And uh, maybe Bubba and Chris agree, rephrase that on, you're not starting a gaming initiative, you're starting an educational initiative around game design, right? Uh, coding, Java, Python, right? And with those uh, that equipment for, you know, those workstation equipments, adding a graphics card that supports gaming is now a multi-purpose room, right? is now a way that in your smaller school, or maybe you were serving a larger district, um, you can now bus people to that larger gaming space um, and create an entire ecosystem on your campus around. It. Just one of a lot of ideas that you know we can share with you here. But I do want to go into a very difficult question. Uh, we're almost halfway through this uh, webcast. And the biggest hiccup that a lot of people find, whether it be uh, partners going after schools, or whether it just be a kid, right, or a teacher uh, wanting to start this initiative. Uh, that happens a lot more often than not. You know, they buy equipment off of any maybe online space they find, or they bring it from home, um, maybe donated. What does outreach look like, right? You want to start a community initiative. You want to start something that builds upon, you know, what is already there. Uh, and you don't want to bring in a lot of external factors because then people come at first to it. But how do you attempt to go after outreach on the community level, whether it be a school or whether it be, you know, maybe a small statewide initiative? Um, and I'll, I'll bring that over to you just for opening thoughts, Chris. But where do you start when you're looking for support in, in community development with esports? I think you look at the full ecosystem, Logan. I mean, you know, we, we've rung up the career and pathways already, right? And so whether it be a mom and pop computer shop or whether it be a reseller as far as games or whether it be, you know, somebody big is, you know, uh, you know, a, a Logitech or anybody like that, where you they have a pipeline to so, someone that actually plays games from a student perspective. And so you bring that partner in, uh, you do some activations, right? You do you do that type of outreach. Um, you know you might want to host a parents' night and have somebody come in like a DNH and tell them what the full scope of the ecosystem looks like, or you know do giveaways or you know hey uh, I'm a I'm a I'm a coder 
and I come in and talk to the youth about what my day to day is. Uh, I'm always big on exposure leads to expansion. And so if you bring someone in uh, from a partner's perspective and in the name of outreach, in the name of exposing everybody to what's out there, I think that's how you slowly build your community. Uh, and you have to be a little bit open to, you know, having different types of uh, career pathways and different types of companies to come in. Uh, and I know that gets kind of iffy when it gets down to uh, education in the high school, but at the same time, you know, it's enough companies out here in the ecosystem where you can kind of vet them out, make sure you're bringing in the, the, the right type of environment uh, or, or company into the environment of the school. And then from there, slowly build and slowly grow your your community that way. Perfect. Uh, Bubba, do you have anything to add on kind of that building out community more than just, you know, that equipment piece or that general school piece? Like, how are we sure. supposed to bring all of these people that Chris brought in mm -hmm. or that suggested mm -hmm. into this ecosystem? Yeah, I mean, it actually, it's kind of funny because it goes with Rodney's question here in the chat about, you know, how to explain esports. I think you can't build a community with people who have no idea what esports is and or, or potentially how, know how to maybe write it correctly with no lowercase e and capital S or no dash, just throwing True. that out. Oh. I, should have, a slide. I should have you a slide didn't. at the beginning. That you want to be taken like, seriously. This is how to spell. Yeah. Bubba, you went there, man. I go there. I go there often. I try not to be a gatekeeper, <laughs> but I want to, I want you guys to know if you want to be taken seriously in the esports space, Spell it with a capital E in the beginning of a sentence or a lowercase e in the sentence. None of that E-mail stuff. It's, it's how you like regularly S. spell the word soccer, right? Like no I always capital use S that. Either. Is, is you capitalize, capitalize the word soccer at the beginning of a sentence, and then if it's part of a national league, you know, you mm -hmm. capitalize it in there. But otherwise, just lowercase mm -hmm. the rest of the letters when you're talking about it. Correct. And you'll, you'll be surprised Correct. how much clout you'll get in the space or how much respect 100%. from people that know about it when you, mm -hmm. you know, don't go after the APA formatting mm -hmm. of, you know, the term. Yeah. So when, so when Rodney's asking about a video, I mean, yeah, that's something we created at the Varsity Esports Foundation called What is Esports? Because we got the same question over and over. And we turned what was 30 minute phone calls about somebody saying, hey, I heard about uh, this ninja guy and I heard about scholarships for college students playing video games. No way. So that's why we created a bunch of our courses. And then that led also into the DNH certification that you can take on dnh.com slash esports at the bottom and take that course. If you're a partner, you get a discount already, right? So that's a pretty big deal. That's like half off. But like that those is. kind of things, those kind of videos, you can also share some of those free video content. Uh, what is esports with those administrators? That's exactly why we created those things to help build that community in the sense of helping people understand it. There's got to be literacy. This is one of our big pushes here the past few years is literacy about the industry, about the um, about gaming overall, and especially about how it develops community and it develops um, in other uh, aspects of your school, as well as maybe even teaching people that are in your own company. If you're working at a company that is a reseller that partners with DNH, and you you have a boss who who just wants to make sure schools only get stuff so they can learn how to type because that's all kids know nowadays, and that's old way thinking because that's how we were when when maybe that's all we were doing when I was type a kid, to learn, was baby. How to type. <laughs> Right, right. A little, little different, a little different. A lot, a lot of coding. Little fall on the community. keyboards. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's all you need. <laughs> yeah. So, the, providing providing literacy is really, really important when it comes to building community because people need to know what the heck this is. It's not just a sexy word, and there's a lot of, a lot of conversation about the ROI and return on investment of let's sponsor this team, this org, this thing, which is great, but you're really going to see the bigger return on investment with working with vendors and getting those uh, devices in a school because that's your future employees, that's your future consumers as well. Mm -hmm. I agree. And you both bring up, again, just on the ball. We've got the right people on the call here. Uh, the biggest thing is, you know, when that outreach happens from my experience, you know, we work at Minnesota Esports Club. If you're doing a community initiative, right, maybe, uh, you know, you're SMB and you're saying, hey, I really i don't know how it can do a statewide initiative right but i really want to get this started at a, at a middle school or a high school in my area going after you know local banks right or 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 
you know, grocery stores, other mom and pop shops that want to support, you know, they, they have kids or grandkids that are in the area, right? They, they already, they, they just need that extra oomph. They need that video, right? Uh, or Sports Foundation, I don't, uh, they need, uh, you know, that extra power to say, okay, you know, this can be beneficial. I've heard it on the news, right? I've watched a couple specials. Maybe, you know, I've seen it on a, a show as a, you know, a, a pop culture piece. And you know, I don't know how I feel about it, but my own kids play these games, right? And I want to build this out for them. Now, in, in my case, we've been able to find in our local communities throughout the state, there's always another organization that might not be able to foot the cost of all of the electronics out there. But to Chris Turner's point earlier, they can support a raffle for extra funding, right? Um, there's mm -hmm. fundraising initiatives that you can bring in, uh, which is a nice little segue into uh, streaming and funding that we'll talk about here is at a school level and at a community level is uh, the polling question will be, you know, do you in currently engage in, you know, any streaming platform, but building on those streaming platforms and, you know, social media and, you know, working in the space, right? How do you get funding other than maybe a community, but how does the school you know, go after that funding the right way, right? There's going to be a couple stumbles, right? But are they looking for grants? Are they, you know, looking for something to provide scholarships? Are they trying to find tangential funding from another STEM initiative that is then used to support the overall gaming and STEM program? Chris Turner, in your experience, where is that funding initiated from? Um, you know, I was, I was blessed to have somebody in the house to help us uh, write grants at the high school, um, you know, and, and other entities on campus, they have grant writers as well. But if you don't, uh, I've done uh, things like, uh, remember I'm in South Louisiana, so I've done crawfish ball fundraisers or, you know, for cancer month, hey, kids, let's bring $2 to school, you're able to wear pink socks. You know, simple things like that that add up over time for you to, to get funding. And I think a lot of people, um, you know, because we're coming out of COVID, we had a lot of COVID funds too that, that were available uh, and still are. I think they might be in like round two right now as far as that funding. But, you know, um, to your point, Logan, you know, that on the ground approach, you know, you might want to do a food truck rally or, you know, festival or anything like that that you would normally do for traditional sports. Like I I tell people all the time, eSports is a one-on-one -on -one copy of traditional sports on the back end, on the front end. Culturally, it looks a little different. Um, but anything that worked in tr traditional sports, you know, whether you want to go, you know, sell coupon books or, you know, whatever, whatever your general fundraiser was, you know, for me, you know, uh, our online fundraiser worked great <clears throat> where you set up a link, you send it out and say, hey, donate what you want. This is why we're raising funds. And once you hit them with all the bullet points that we talked about earlier, GPA, you know, attendance, hey, the benefits of esports and not just us competing for championships and scholarships, which is great. But once you, you know, you sell the whole scope, it's easy to uh, gain those funds. Perfect. Uh, and you are definitely right on the money on what scope looks like, right? Uh, you have to be able to fully explain, you know, what is the scope of this project to this champion of the program, whether it be that teacher, whether it be that administrator and say, hey, you know, um, to Bubba's point, there's only X amount of high schools that are doing this throughout the country, right? Um, there's so much more that you can do, you can start and initiate. And with those um, social emotional learning funds that are still out there in states um, from state legislator. Again, it's it's coming back to can you create and help facilitate with the school or the district a new and fun way to grab those and oh, but is the number 80 percent, 80 percent of students that are not traditionally in, you know, uh, regular yep. extracurricular activities. Is it 82 percent, 82. Yep. yep. And that's that's incredible. You know, when I heard about that. It was just, it was boggled my mind because in my mind, I did all the sports in high school. I was a small town. Our school had 500 <laughs> kids, K through 12. Uh, I'm not joking about that number. Uh, and it was just, I did it all, right? And I was a game. 
uh, there's 82% mm -hmm. of, of, of students don't participate in any other extracurricular at all, but I guarantee you a good chunk of them do game and want to participate and still do teamwork. They just do it at home, right? Uh, you mm -hmm. want to bring that facilitation, whether it's in the classroom, into an extracurricular, maybe there's a third party location off, off the school uh, general campus that can be supported by you know another business. And so I want to go into the results of the polling question here is can I throw out, have, can I throw out uh, I was going to throw out more more fun you asked about funding stuff and oh yeah uh, Chris gave the really great answers because I, I I was learning as I was listening but uh when you mentioned state funding there's ESSER funds ESSER three ESSER funds. elementary yep. mm -hmm, elementary and secondary school emergency relief there's been three stages the third one is the one that allows people schools to ask for things that are tech and after school. Uh, ESSER fund one and two didn't have kind of that after school techie stuff, but there's a niche for uh, esports and gaming clubs with the ESSER three funds. Now that's like E-S-S-E-R is what you're looking for. Every state, sadly, because this is how our government and our school districts and schools work, it's not a federally go and apply for it. It's a per state thing. And every state has horrible systems in place to actually <laughs> apply for those. Um, not every state. Some states are doing a good job, but there's states out there that you can go and just type in E-S-S-E-R three application and your state name into a search engine and you'll find the Ohio ESSER fund uh, portal. And so that's a really, really big thing. And the reason I mentioned it the most, because it came with, uh, it was part of COVID relief uh, back in, this, mm -hmm. was, this one was late 2021 or early, or 2020, whatever it was. Uh, it was big last year. And there's literally millions of dollars sitting there that people don't know how to apply for. And so there, there are resources on our website under our grant section where you can go and find out like an assistance guide on how to apply for those for your state. Because it's, there's literally just sitting, just sitting there because people either don't know about it or don't know how to write a grant because teachers are <laughs> teachers are working teachers. a lot. <laughs> teachers are yeah, doing what teachers they're do. They're focused on their subjects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So help out with uh, with any of that. It's fun. And then we have a ton of, we have like 60 different grant opportunities on our, on our website as well. Exactly. And great push. Uh, I did want to bring up uh, the engagement on external platforms. We have about 40%. Actually, I mean, in total, you know, 65% that do engage in these social or these streaming platforms, whether it be for gaming, just talking, maybe you're watching a cooking stream, you know, you're engaging in the same type of entertainment that these kids are, right? In, in the same type of entertainment that brings them to the gaming space already naturally and organically, right? Uh, you can then leverage that as, you know, into communication. Oh, I got to sneeze, but let's see if I can hold it in. I'm just going to look at the sun, right? All right. Anyway, so you can bring those into <laughs> communication, PR, broadcast, right? You can use it in the Pro AV cell as well and say, hey, you know, Pro Audio and Visual, Visual Solutions can build out certain departments. And in doing so, right, we can talk about broadcasting and content creation because more and more kids, I, I hear this, I, I don't have the numbers on it, but there are more and more uh, kids out there from you know, middle to high school and going into college that are like, I want to be my own boss in content creation, right? I mm -hmm. want to work on digital design, right? I wanna create videos that inspire people. I wanna change the world like this. And you wanna grab that inspiration, bring it into the scholastic field and attach that funding piece we talked about, right? Um, we want to go after multiple avenues and they're out there. So if you have a school that focuses a lot on that communication piece, maybe they have a great forensics program, right? Esports is still available to, to add as a tangent, to add as an attach. Um, the same with uh, when a school has a great STEM program, you go, awesome. What have you thought about game design? Um, the biggest thing here is with this, obviously, that you're seeing on screen, a lot of you are still engaging and meeting, even though you don't realize it, meeting the students where they're at when it comes to entertainment, right? You can now bring, uh, you know, more viewer and watch uh, viewership data to these schools and say, all right, right. You, you want to educate these students about these platforms, right? You want to be able to show that you are listening to where they're coming from um, because a lot of schools are still maybe 
not finding that lesson plan or, or finding that extra curriculum to put them over the top when it comes to achieving that funding task. That was a lot. And don't worry, you can watch this video a bunch of times at DNH TV. Um, but the biggest questions, and we're going to kind of go through some of the questions now, um, as I do want to bring up Chris Price's question uh, for Chris Turner and Bubba. Uh, we'll start with Chris. Is What was the biggest challenge uh, that you faced when starting uh, your esports program or programs? Like, uh, what did you find as like the number one hurdle that you had to get over? <laughs> funding. It was, it was pre-COVID. <laughs> Seriously, like it was funding. Uh, my demographic might be a little different. It might be the same of, of some some resellers on the call. Um, but, you know, I'm on an HBCU college campus. Uh, historically, we're underfunded. Uh, just like the high school, you know, it's kind of similar to Logan's high school. It's pre-K through 12th grade, you know, roughly 400 kids. 75% of them are free and reduced lunch. So we had to find partners uh, like Logan mentioned earlier uh, to, you know, donate uh, different um, services or different products. Um, you know, our, our gaming uh, tables came out of our architect building that was being tore down. Uh, and we found them and got pickup trucks and wiped them down and <laughs> got them shipped over to the high school. I mean, where there's a will, there's a way. Um, and so that's that's my biggest hurdle. I think my second biggest hurdle, and which I, I, if I can go back, I always tell people I, I, I want to do better in, and it's it's parent and administrator buy-in, uh, not not only administrator but teachers too, uh, and educating them on what esports is, the tracks, everything that we've preached so far spending some time and making sure that all the stakeholders at the school and everybody understood what what this is all about and it's not just about gaming i know you hear that all the time uh but i want to kind of hammer it in especially if you're going to uh try to go into high schools you need the full you need to sell the full story and, and showcase the full track perfect uh bubba uh, what are you seeing? Uh, what's 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 the major hurdles? Um, yeah, funding is, is I think funding is always it, and that's why it's so difficult when we're talking about hey, let's put equipment in schools, and the funding is always the issue because of the nature of our school systems um, when it comes to public schooling. Uh, when it comes to private schooling, there's plenty of schools out there doing just fine uh, when it comes mm -hmm. to having esport programs. Uh, and uh, and that's kind of that's actually why we built the foundation. Uh, out of necessity, we saw all the schools in the suburbs doing just fine with esport programs. Uh, schools in with in with students in disenfranchised areas with systemic inequality, um, th those schools don't get the same support, uh, especially you know taxes, uh, property taxes, and just overall systemic issues. And so. You know, I would rather our foundation be funded out of existence where we don't exist, where the community and the school districts support each and every school equally across the state and not just per district or per um, city. And so funding yeah, is an issue. And that is a hurdle. But there are opportunities and there are resources like the ones we've talked about already. And I think that one paired with violence in video games and screen time. So the, some, of the, some of the top games in the eSports space scholastically are the shooter, shooter games. Rainbow Six Siege is a top game. It is a incursion kind of secret agent. I don't know how to describe it. It's, it's a shooting up game. It's a first person shooter. Uh, Fortnite has been very popular over the past few years and especially more popular with us boomers nowadays because there's no building. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> the... Those, those Overwatch and Valor games do have guns, and those objections do come in. We have we have answers to those objections in our trainings with dnh.com slash esports. You can find that again. The, the overcoming those common objections are not trying to, uh, you know, clickbait or 
wow people with some cool tagline like, well, I mean, this is, the, this is a terminology I've used before, but when a school in Kentucky or Texas says we're not going to allow shooting up games in our school to for students to play, yet you pass seven shooting ranges on your way to school, it's a bit it's a bit funny. So it's how, it's how how it is right now, and especially this week has not been the greatest uh, to have this conversation around guns and school. Um, it's very very sad week, um, and. So that can be a big calm ejection. Uh, right now, you're going to see a lot of blaming video games in the next week or two about school shootings. You're going to see video games. And more and more and more again, you're going to see over overwhelming uh, retorts that here's the data that shows that's not true. So those and, objections and, are there. Uh, yeah, definitely. You're right, Bob. I think the, 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 the selling parents on that experience does come in uh, to a violent standpoint. When I was... Uh, a, co a collegiate coach, uh, the biggest sell to a, a private institution is they're team-based, right? Rainbow Six Siege is team-based. You go after an objective as a team, and technically, you don't even have to fire a shot to win the game. Sure. Right? There is there is other... Fortnite's a little different, but you can really go... <laughs> uh, you can you can really go and, and, and dive deeper into the the question without even bringing up firearms, right? How is this communication working? How is, how is, how are students relating this? You know, it's a 5v5 game, so is basketball, right? You're still shouting things, you're still giving up signs, you're still communicating. And, and I think that's the sell if you come across that roadblock, right? When you're trying to build a local or community program where you're building a space is, if folks come to you with that, you can give them the numbers, the numbers are out there, right? Um, you can you can point to different things that are happening in, in the current state of the world, but you can also say at a basic level when you're participating in these, and maybe you sit down with them, maybe you get the opportunity to sit down and put a headset on and say, all right, uh, show me how we're going to win this game without communicating, right? Um, that's why they're esports. You know, they are team-based and they're spectator sports, right? Which, again, in the platforms that we have. Um, to move to the last major topic of today, and I know we have a, a couple of minutes left, is uh, we're talking about the overall, um, how do you say it? Uh, the overall purchase of a program. Uh, programs can start really small, right? You can have a 3v3 Rocket League program. Mm -hmm. You can have program made of consoles, right? Uh, the question I have for everyone here is, you know, for those that have quoted or maybe are looking to quote, you know, what's your average quote? Uh, a lot of schools are looking at you know, an under 10K buy-in. Some have a little bit more funds with maybe STEM funding as well. But for Bubba and Chris, mm -hmm. you know, are, and yes or no, with some elaboration, are most labs in multi-purpose spaces being built mm -hmm. relatively cheaply? So uh, it's great questions for how much it costs. And I would say that it can be free. And I, you need to think of these sells as a two, three year long-term process sometimes because uh, the schools that have funding that, Hey, we're diving in, we're going to, we're going to spend 30 K in an esports arena is not very common, but it does happen. And their school bonds. I mean, Dallas did like a 3 million billion, I don't know, whatever, <laughs> something yeah, bond and got like s seven esports arenas uh, in their school districts. So that happens, but they also were doing a really good, good job down there and it's Texas. Right. And, so you can do you can start at zero dollars, and that's always something you want to approach, especially being on good terms with a school or a champion in the school. Of, I'm not maybe I'm not you know you go into it maybe I'm not here to sell you something, but you know not right now. But down the road, when you get more competitive, you want more kids. There's more kids playing. There's more game titles that need to be played, and more higher power devices that are needed. That's when the sales come in. But you can always start with zero because kids have devices they can bring into school, and kids can play. Other kids can play with them, and you know it's just getting the IT director to say yes to opening ports uh, <laughs> for those things, which is a, the, the conversation I know that came up as a question earlier about getting getting things open. But zero to thousand. So the hard thing is you get a lead from from somewhere, and you're like, hey, this school wants to do stuff, but maybe they only want to get three computers for new computers, high power ones, or maybe they just want to upgrade their GPUs, which is actually a pretty good thing because they're expensive um, right now. And 
uh, for sales, and they want to upgrade their computer lab that is doing computer engineering or graphic design or AutoCAD or whatever, and they would need to upgrade their uh, you know, the graphics cards, which is good. It, it's not the full term or it's not the the long term solution because you would definitely want to get more high powered uh, monitors that have a high refresh rate, you know, better m mice and keyboards for, you know, speed of click and, and all these other things. So it, it, it takes some time to get a sell for maybe bigger, higher power stuff, but uh, we kind of, we kind of throw a number out anywhere from 10 to $30,000 is like an esports lab. Ideally, I know Chris has done it different ways and done it with <laughs> lots of good sponsorship, yeah. lots of good sponsorships and opportunities and 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 the good old supply chain that is affecting everyone uh, for time on when yeah. things come in to play. But yeah, uh, I, that's my kind of range I, I usually talk about. Uh, yeah, Chris, what what range have you experienced? Uh, and, you know, maybe you're seeing to maybe even just create a complete lab that maybe has a little bit of consoles for those that are playing those sports titles. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, for those traditional team-based games that we see at every institution. It, it's really a detailed, you know, school by school type of basis. I, I mean, I started at the zero mark at Southern University Laboratory School, which is the high school that I mentioned. Um, and then we got a grant for 10. And then my principal found some funds. So it put us around that 15 to 20K mark. Uh, but you know, when you when you when you put in all the sponsorships and the equipment that was donated, it took us into the, the twenty k and above. Um, building out a space that right now for the law center, um, you know, you're looking at you know forty plus computers, and that puts you over the twenty k mark automatically. So it just depends. Uh, you know, I, I tell a lot of high schools though. Uh, you know, fresh, fresh, you know, making a call to your local paint store to get fresh paint and getting your parents together to go paint a wall is, is it costs nothing but time. Uh, so little, little stuff like that. Um, LED lights works wonders in the room. It changes the whole mood. Look at Bubba's background. Uh, <laughs> you know, so you know, like you said earlier, Logan, like if you want to do three through Rocket League, you know, you're only talking about six PCs. Are you talking about three, uh, six uh, uh, switches? Are you know, that's a cross player game. It just depends on what you're trying to do at that particular time. Are you just trying to build a community of gamers and introduce them to STEM tracks? Or if you're trying to go competitive, that's a whole different story. But I think to scale, uh i would say between that <clears throat> between that 15 to 20k plus uh probably is the average you're gonna see uh but you can get it done in that 10 to 15k mark um if you're mixing consoles and pcs together and you know you have everybody on board to make it happen i agree that, that's why uh, you, that's why you survey that's why you survey kids first to survey see what they want to play Yes, exactly. because you could say, hey, I'm going to sell you six PCs. And all the kids are like, we wanted to play Madden. And yeah. you have no Xboxes yeah. now. And uh, now the now the school's mad at you for selling six PCs when they're not going to use them. And, and that's, Long -term. A, that's, a, that's a big part of it is uh, obviously check out your area. You need to be able to pull or the administration of the school needs to be able to pull the students to be like, what titles are you playing? Right. We are going to start there. And then, you know, later you can introduce. Oh, and also we're going to bring out x popular game in the next you know four years and that's when that next round of buying goes in uh to look at the results here under 10k what you're going to get from that is you're going to you know you're setting up monitors you're asking students to bring in switches right or nintendo switches uh you're going to buy xboxes you're going to create a cool space that is already available on campus right you're going to retrofit a space uh you can make it mobile you know bring in a cart house the equipment put it off somewhere so you can you know use that lounge for something else but you can definitely make an esports competitive experience or community experience for under 10K, right? As Chris Turner said, yeah. uh, community funding, you know, uh, pay the ball, put up yeah. LED lights, right? It's about the time you put yeah. into it. That 10 to 15 mark right. to not, not, not to cut you off, Logan. Go for it. Not to cut you off, I'm sorry. But 
I, I want everybody, all the resellers and everybody that's that's watching right now. I started my program off with my PlayStation with two controllers and a rolling cart smart board. So it can, it can be done, trust me. So go exactly. ahead, I just wanted to make that point. Uh, no, Peter Young, for the executive director at uh, Minnesota Esports Club, he, he started in, he brought in his streaming PC and uh, his PlayStation and, and, and two computers, right? At, like, mm. that's that might be what teachers are, you know, are going through. Um, when you're looking at that 10 to 15K, you're looking at, you know, a six computer setup, right? Um, and maybe that's it, right? Or you're looking at a mix of three computers, consoles, right? Like you're looking to mix and match. And I know we have a lot at 20K and above, and those are the actual build outs of, all right, we're, we're doing networking. We're, you know, we're working with the IT personnel. We're actually finding a good location in the school that is central to student engagement, right? And maybe we make it mobile and, and maybe we only have laptops and, you know, like these are all questions that you will work with the school to answer. And these quotes that you've done for those that have responded, that's important, right? Uh, kind of keeping track of what that looks like because it's going to change. Uh, and, and Bubba and Chris, the amount of money schools are going to be willing to spend on, you know, esports or gaming solutions. Uh, is going to go up, right? Because this is going to be an in-demand market for the rest of you know the 25,000 schools across the country, right? And so it is starting down with these numbers and going, this is what on average we see a school invest, right? And I'm glad that we're all able to kind of visualize that because it can be zero, it can be community funded. And for some that are unsure about it, maybe you start there. But for those that want to dive in head first, don't be afraid to say, all right, this is the investment we need here, you know, at, you know, 20K and above, because we want to outfit a full competitive arena that you can bring in other schools to have competitions in, right? You can look mm -hmm. for that external funding and create a community experience without winning national championships or, or doing statewide activities. You're here to engage the students and you're here to make these incredible spaces and schools really couldn't do it without folks on this call. Um, we're going to answer some questions. Amy has a great question for Chris and Bubba. Um, what are reseller partners doing really well um, that you've seen that are helping schools uh, with esports and gaming? Taking the DNH certification. Resellers, Ooh. that is your biggest end to being able to <laughs> go and speak to schools. If you if you know what Dragnet is and you flash your bad, I don't know, this is, I'm not this old. But like, you know, splash You're your bad. badge, you? like, just the facts, man. And I'm, for, I'm, I'm 40. I'm 40 next, like, in a less than a month. Uh, Wasn't Dragon Man black I, and white? I watch reruns. <laughs> so taking the certification is one of the biggest things you can do as a reseller to be able to give you the education, the literacy, the insight, and the, the, the power to go in and say, look, I I want to help you, and I know what I'm talking about. So that is that is the biggest, most successful thing. Because we see, I get I get all those results. I get all the testimonies from all the people who've taken it, and I, I love hearing from them and saying, wow, this really helped me. I got to start this program, that program. So that is my that is my biggest plug. And answer. All right. Anything from your end, Chris? Um. <clears throat> Go and take that certification. I've, I've <laughs> taken it. it. It will help you, trust me. Um, but I think coming into, as far as being a reseller, uh, being resourceful, uh, letting them know, hey, you can go take this course too, or hey, this is where you go get funding, or this is where you go to get your best bang for your buck, you know, as far as products on DNH or <clears throat> anything else, just being that one-stop shop, being... Uh, that 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 main resource for them because it's going to be a bunch of questions, and you want to make sure that you're able to point them in the right directions. And I think that's what I've saw resellers do a great job at. And from a broad strokes, coming from a distributor, what I've seen, uh, not naming names, uh, happen is to Chris's point, being that one stop shop. But also, you know, we talk about meeting students where they're at. You got to meet the schools, you know, where they're coming from. Yeah, you got to ask that extra question and say, well, if you're not doing STEM initiatives, I found that out because I asked you, right? I didn't just come in here with an esports proposal, being the one-stop shop, and then suddenly 
I wonder why they're not fighting because mm -hmm. I know it's a cool opportunity, but maybe their their needs fall in something else. And you might already be doing that, but it's just maybe the tack around saying it or finding that champion of the program to help you as well. Um, as we near the end, because we're, we're coming to come uh, across on time here, um, I do want to give a shout out again to our program sponsors, Logitech, Intel, Lenovo, MSI, AOC, NVIDIA, and Razer. I also want to give a large uh, round of applause. Uh, you can do it at home. Uh, to Chris Turner and Bubba Gator, we appreciate you being on the call here today um, to talk about building out that high school esports program, especially the key points of looking for that opportunity, finding out who to approach, and outreach and funding. Uh, those are the main things that are going to prevent schools from making this possible in the community, as well as uh, prevent you from finishing that cell or understanding how you can build it out uh, within yourself. Um, I also want to direct you to uh, DNH Thread happening in June. Uh, we're less than a month away. Feel free to sign up. Go to dnh.com. Uh, it'll be the first thing that pops up to register. Um, you can see my beautiful face, and we have a full esports set up there, along with all of your friends and, and co-workers in the industry. Uh, it's going to be a really exciting time. You can make it out to Hershey. Um, and then last but not least, I manage the page, but check out dnh.com slash esports. At the bottom, there's Get Certified as an Esports Expert through the Esports Education Network that Bubba and we all have been talking about. Uh, and you get a discount through DNH as long as you uh, reach out uh, at esports at dnh.com. I'll be more than happy to help you out there as well. Um, and if you've already done it, uh, we have a recertification for 2022 um, that you can take. Uh, no discount on that, but it is a lot cheaper. Uh, and so, you know, run through the gauntlet again. Gaming changes every year, and we want you to change with it. So that being said, we appreciate your time, and thanks for tuning in, everybody. Thanks, guys. See everyone. Dnh.com.